Hello, everybody. Today is December 28th, 2023, and I'm honored to have with me uh, my guest today, filmmaker Eli Steele. Eli, tell us about yourself, uh, your journey, and your recent work. Thank you for having me. Um, it's an honor to be here. Um, I've always been a filmmaker, probably ever since I left um, college um, in 1996. Um, worked a lot in the independent film world. Um, got a chance to direct my first feature film in 2004. Um, did an MTV pilot in 2007. And since then, I've been doing documentaries. Um, the most, the biggest one, the, um, how Jack became black. And um, the I did one about three years ago with my father, um, Shelby Steele, on what killed Michael Brown. Um, and for the last two years, for the last, you know, uh, actually, for about two years, I worked for Fox News, where I did all these like short documentaries. Um, I probably did about, I don't know, maybe 20 in two years, which was kind of crazy. Um, and now I'm back in the independent documentary world, and I'm doing a, um, a new documentary um, based on my father's book, um, White Guilt. And we still have adapted that book, which was published in 2007, I believe, to um, two days war, because obviously the race game has escalated. I mean, everything escalated to uh, today. So it seemed very innocent back in 2007 that we decided that we were just uh, trying to take another stab at the, uh, the craziness of America. Of America. So I've, I've watched your movie, uh, What Killed Michael Brown. Um, can you tell us the, the rationale, the reasons behind that movie? And secondarily, can you tell us the, the pathway of prevention that Amazon put out in front of you? It doesn't seem as if they um, saw it as a net positive uh, to be on its platform. I'm wondering whether you had resistance to its production and resistance to its propagation, to its putting out to the world. Yes, um, I would definitely with my father um, when the whole Michael Brown Ferguson thing was unfolding. So we were just steady, you know, together watching the TV. And I remember when the top the reports started coming out. Because before the, the hand of those shoot narrative had taken off. And so we were like, wait for the evidence, just wait for the evidence. So the evidence started trickly out. And what was surprising was that narrative, the hand of those shoot did not collapse, it did not come back to um like the the fact and the narrative did not come together or anything, it, it split. And for us, it was sort of a, uh, a microcosm of the split that was happening in America over race. And, and for us, that was a shocking development that the, um, what my father called the poet is truth, that narrative, the hand of the shooting, you know, it, it, it sounds truthful, but it's not. It, it never happened. And, um, how that has so much power and why. And so that was the motivation for why we should to go ahead and make this movie. And the other reason was there was something like, at that time, at now there's about five or six documentaries on the Michael Brown incident from the other side. Back then, there were probably about three or four. And we said, well, if we don't make this documentary, then the narrative to continue. The narrative just uh, goes unchallenged. And so that was a big motivation for why we wanted to make this because um, obviously, you know, um, having strong ties to the black community and so forth, we wanted to make a film that was sort of, hey, come on, this is really what happened. And you know if that's what happened. And the response from them was very, very positive, very, um, you know, they, they kind of know what was going on. And so, I, I, I was editing the film and we were still very close to um, finishing the edit. Um, George Floyd happened. That is bloating. So, okay. <laughs> Which is not the, it's not necessarily where you want to have, have to happen when you're almost done with the film. I mean, yeah. you're working on it for almost, you know, at that time, almost three years, you're starstruck, you wanted to be done. 
but obviously we had to deal with it. And um, I remember my mother was like, you know what, let's just take two weeks. Let's just chill out, let's just let it unfold. And she was right, and then um, it basically became a repeat in terms of, in terms of the theme that we were talking about with Michael Brown. We played in George Floyd. So the theme, we were able to sort of use George Floyd to reinforce. Yeah, this is something that keeps happening. It's a repeti- repetition, it's the exploitation, exploitation, it's a grab for power, all of that stuff. And so then you have this film coming out. And Amazon obviously jumped on the Black Lives Matters bandwagon at that time, as most of the corporations in America, most of the universities did. Almost everybody from high school, even, even elementary school, to the president, I mean, um, to not, not, not Trump, but to um, leaders all over the nation released statements about George Floyd, how it was horrible and everything. And so we were sort of coming in as sort of a contrarian, something that was sort of offering a different picture. And I think that there are um, almost every corporation has their social justice activists, the people inside of it. And so we got the rejection letter um, on the Tuesday before the Friday that we were going to release the film. So you can imagine how much money we could put in to promote that film on Amazon, and then boom, it disappeared. So I had to quickly pivot and put it onto another platform, uh, Vimeo. Um, but it shows you the power of, of corporation and the big question for Amazon was, you told us that you were a platform, which means anything can go on to that platform as long as it meets your, um, your uh, condition, which we did. We did not have extreme violence, particular violence, extreme profanity, nudity, none of that. I mean, was, anybody who watches the film knows that everything it's that very, we It's have. very straightforward. I mean, yeah. I the, the case of Michael Brown itself is almost very straightforward. If you'd imagine yeah. that the case of Michael Brown happened 100 years ago, there would be he said, she said. But here, there was video in the actual convenience store. I mean, you know, we have a window into these events such as we never had before. We have people's social media. In the case of Trayvon Martin, um, you know, we had uh, all kinds of his uh, toting guns and, and all this kind of stuff. And, and people just still willfully ignore some of those things. And it seems to me that we are, in this case of Amazon, putting a, a political thumb on the scale in order to have certain narratives go untouched. Did, did, did the word, did your movie of Michael Brown, did its um, propagation and promotion suffer because of Amazon's decisions? Yes, you know, I mean, um, I mean, it is it is tougher in terms of um, when you promote a film because when you when you make a film, you penny pinchy every which way. I mean, I'm flying Southwest because I know I could get two bags on a plane for free. <laughs> you know, I mean, I mean, I'm calculating every penny because I'm saving everything for post for the release of the film. So when you days with somebody two or three days before the film so you come out with all the ad, advertisement all of that it's not gonna work well you can't get the money back so that's devastating and we're, we're not i mean i edit in my house i'm this is my computer i mean i don't have a, a fancy studio i'm not backed by millions of dollars so everything counts and so at the same time when you um uh suppress somebody in America, which I think is the beauty of America, is that other people will rise up and support you. So we got immense support from so many people. Um, Fox News, Wall Street Journal was very supportive. I mean, they did, um, I think in one week, three pieces on our film. Hmm. And they left it up the whole, on, on the top, the whole weekend. And so our film, when, uh, when Amazon finally backed down, it makes you number one, number one spot. Um, and it was there for about, um, I believe about 10 days. Um, and they were to the top 10 for at least um, two months, which is amazing. And yeah, it showed, and I think all of that also helped out because we also got a lot of um, 
people that was thought of, you know, with all the cancel culture and a lot of people who are on the left don't like cancel culture, do they start coming over and watch the film? And so we we round up Rishi, a pretty wide audience outside of the conservative bubble, which is our which is our objective. So we don't want to make, make um echo chamber films. Hmm. Yeah, my friend Michael, well, he was my brother's high school friend, uh, Michael Pack, uh, did a, a, a a documentary on Clarence Thomas. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you ever got to see that. Yeah. Um, but it's it was not you know it was kind of willfully not promoted. Uh, it's a wonderful movie, um, and this this you know it, it it's a it's an Clarence Thomas had an incredible life from real poverty. Yeah. And and reached prominence, and he has uh, a strain of independence both in thought and in character that is inimical to, and I hate this term, the, 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 the black community message, whereas it, it's an incredible message of, of perseverance, devotion, education, and following one's own muse. When you talk about uh, your father's book, White Guilt, um, I'm wondering, just because it's top of mind, whether you can bring that to bear on a life like Clarence Thomas and the way his life is viewed or not, or is prevented from being viewed by a black audience to the same extent as hands up, don't shoot narratives by LeBron James. Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. Uh, for the last, this year, we've had this like black identity I mean, I'll give you a brief example to my, my grandfather uh, working in the civil rights movement, and his goal was to be American. We show after these the fisheries and the dishes, my father entered the Black Power movement. Mm -hmm. So he came home to my grandfather and started talking about Black this, Black that. And my grandfather was like, what is Black? Now you're talking about the way who was born to slave. He was born in 1900. My father was born in 1940. I was born in 1974. So my great grandfather was actually born in slavery. It's just uh, the gap is still wide. Um, and so for him to tell my father, well, what do you mean, we black? So black identity is something that was still created. And I can understand the. Um, there's some good aspects to it because black people have been told that they were, you know, ugly, they were primitive, they, their hair was nasty, all of that stuff. So there needs to be some sort of big boost of um, esteem, you know, that you should be, you know, proud of who you are. But then it became this political thing. And so if you don't conform to the black identity, whoever's in charge of that black identity, you're out. So for somebody like my father, for somebody like Clarence Thomas, where they say, you know what? Um, I'm gonna be my own man. I'm not gonna conform. I'm gonna speak my own mind. You'll be punished. And this is the same thing with the film, uh, what killed Michael Brown. That's why a lot of my films don't get a lot of attention because the, the contrarian, they don't fit the narrative. They don't fit the black identity. The joke is if I wanted to be, make more money, I would just conform and just give them what they want. And so they were the black people, if you look in the, um, the last two pieces that I wrote um, about a week ago, if you look at the black comment, just they were, he looks white, so he doesn't count. But you know, if I had said something that they, they backed up their narrative, they'd be like, hey, brother. And so, you know, I, so I, that for me is false. I don't want, I don't, it doesn't bother me when it's negative, and it surely does not gonna give me any happiness if it's positive, because I don't cater to that identity. We should be talking about who controls the black identity today. Candy, no, uh, the Disney 19 people, Obama. I mean, who controls the black identity? And why do I need to conform to that? Look at the the stupidity of a white person conforming to a white, white identity. Who, who determines that? And so that's why it's a, it's, just a, it's a very weird thing. And so that's why I think that like Clarence Thomas, where my father had to pay a huge price just for saying, you know what? I'm an American first. 
And I'm gonna speak my mind, that's an American. And, and that's the bigger identity. That's the identity that includes everything. And why we reject that for a much narrow, suffocated, racial identity. Isn't that the whole point of uh, what we've been trying to do for the last this year, get away from that? And so that's why I identify myself as an American, period. Yeah. So in, in, Leb in uh, Lebanon, um, I think by statute, by constitution, they have to have a Christian president, um, a Druze uh, minister of this, uh, uh, somebody from the Amal, uh, somebody from the Sunni. They have to have different parts of their government mandated by ethnicity. Now, the ethnicity has changed somewhat um, because the, um, the uh, you know, Muslim population has vastly grown and the Christians have been hounded and, and taken out by war. So now you have Hezbollah, which is not part of the part of that original agreement. They are the de facto power and the whole place has obviously torn into civil war and factionalism and, and huge death uh, that doesn't get the headlines that happened in Israel. Um, but there are parts of that country that are under warlords and so forth. But this seems to be the, the natural evolution of dividing people and, 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 and validating them only by these racial characteristics. You know, in, in our country, even at the time of its founding, uh, we think it's all white. I was listening yesterday to uh, Michael Barone, and he did a book on the geography of the American founders and and their minds and he mapped that and there were huge factional differences maryland was catholic we don't see it the same way because it's religious but people have always had their differences and their factions so maryland was catholic founded pennsylvania was quaker new york was dutch reformed uh, virginia was congregationalist massachusetts uh, was puritan um, rhode island was an offshoot of that and these were vastly different worldviews at the time. These were more different from what we see just based on, on kind of facial characteristics. People had vastly different views of, of heaven and earth and what the performance was. And the, the idea and concept of getting these peoples united were, was not obvious. And so what we see now essentially, I think is the devolution of this concept of, of, of getting people together, what I call annealing, when you make steel, to use your last name, Eli Steel, um, to make steel, steel is stronger than iron. It, it, it doesn't rust because you've mixed in other elements. So it's an annealing process, a melding. And it can, it, the actual term, the melting pot, refers in a sense to your name. You know, the melting pot produces steel. And the man of steel uh, is Superman, uh, in, in you know not Friedrich Nietzsche's Superman, but but you know, uh, Krypton Krypton's Superman, and I'm just wondering if you you know given that I think you have appreciation for the Man of Steel with your name, can you talk about this process and in a historical sense, and are we evolving or devolving um, in terms of our melting pot sensibilities and into factionalism? Yeah, I mean. Um... People believe that the power in your eternal qualities, your immutable characteristics, and that sort of kind of goes against the enlightenment. I mean, the whole point of the enlightenment was the age of reason, was that you can move. Especially, I used um, Jewish people as an example. They were in the ghetto all the way up until that until that period because they couldn't trust them by even a different religion. But with um, the enlightenment, the age of reason, you had nation state coming into being. So then, okay, we're gonna identify as a, a nationalist, wherever my country is, that should be my primary identity. And that will allow us to focus on that commonality as opposed to our differences between us as human beings. And that was the big part of the age of reason was you can't be Jewish, I can be Catholic, but we can work together on the common goal. And, but human beings are, are tribal. I mean, we have human beings that are capable of doing that. And we have human beings who are not capable of doing that. They don't trust it or they want power. 
into the divider and into tribal being. You talked about the um, America. Well, if you look in Bacon, uh, what you call Bacon Rebellion, that mm -hmm. was um, 1540s, this something around them. You had the aristocracy, obviously, you had the English. Then beneath, you had the, the lower class, the indentured servants, the you know, first slaves, all of that. You had a mixed race group of people. They were unhappy with the condition, so they rebelled. The ruling class that you know what? We're going to change our society from a class-based society to a race-based society. We're going to tell that lowly white man, you may be poor, but you and I are white people. And so therefore, we're superior to all the, to these women, to these blacks, to these Native Americans. And so that's sort of the first time we had the one drop of black blood rule. And what, what fascinates me is you see this repeated throughout history. For example, I'll give you another short one. So Joseph Smith comes up with the Mormon church. His vision was a multicultural thing where he was a go get a uh, one way slave, Native American, poor people, and then bring them all together and form a church, which makes perfect sense because if you're looking for um, a population for a new religion, that's where you go. And then bring him young, comes along and say, no, we're going to make this a right religion. So one man decides that. Same day back in uh, Bacon Rebellion, those white guys decided that. And for some reason, we follow those people all along. And to my own question is, why can't we flip that? What's we'll stop you from doing that? And a big reason would be a tremendous loss of power. I mean, a tremendous loss of power. If you look at somebody like um, Claudine Gay in um, Harvard, what is the only thing that keeps her in power? Race. I mean, that's it. It's not her merit. Because, because look, people aren't they were racist for pointing out race. No, we're not. You're the racist for putting her in there because of her race. If she was a complex, if she were Arthur Ashe, level like tennis player legend, if she had that talent in academia, everybody in the country would be defending her. It's the fact that we don't see that. It's the fact that you lift race up. And we as the country have allowed that for too long. And so that's why you see this grumbly, you see that this is not fair. Where is it going to lead us? I don't see it. I don't see where they go other than Claudine Gay getting her power and getting her money and her prestige. Oh, where is the benefit for the rest of our society? Yeah, I think it's a terrible message. <clears throat> you know, there's this, um, uh, you know, if I, I, I grew up, uh, insofar as I grew up, I grew up Jewish in New York City, um, in a nice part of New York City. Um, and we had Jewish kids and Irish kids uh, who fought each other. Uh, we didn't know we were all white and we're all supposed to be uh, the you know privileged class, whatever. But you know they had come from immigrants, maybe a, you know partially a generation before us, and and we were, were children of immigrants or grandchildren of immigrants. Uh, we didn't know we were all privileged. You know it's like we were told we had to work and we had to work hard if we wanted something. Yeah. You know, this, the concept that you can, you know, succeed um, by, by kind of this victim hierarchy, um, I compare it, I mean, you brought up a sports example, um, but it, in sports, uh, there's a thing called uh, tanking. So sports has a, has a welfare system within their leagues. Now, their leagues are contrivances. They are basically trusts or monopolies. They're quasi-monopolies, and they, give, they have special rights to do these things which are anti-competitive. Uh, but in the sport itself, people are competing. There's meritocracy. So Claudine Gay, if she were, uh, you know, the Arthur Ashe of tennis, you know, she would fail. If she were in tennis, she'd fail based on her qualities. So in, in sports, you know, we, we, don't, we don't think about the racial composition. Some team is all black, whatever, in, in, the, in, in the NBA or the NFL, or, you know, 80% black, because we, those players got there by merit. Yeah. Uh, but oddly enough, when the teams are not doing well, they, they tank 
they extra, they do even poor, more poorly so they can get a top draft pick. So if you want to get LeBron James back in the day, you have to be a bad team. And then LeBron team, James makes you a good team. Um, but it's, it's, there's kind of an aspect to this where people are, they, they want to tank in their own self in order to get the privilege of, of kind of being drafted high. I'm not making a great example here. No, but, I, I think I know where you're going. Yeah. Fair enough. So I'm wondering if you can comment on that and 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 maybe, you know, kind of tie it together with uh, it's kind of the message for uh, kids today about how to succeed. Yeah, absolutely. If you look at um, let's look at Harvard, as an example, do you have the, uh, my sister went to Harvard? Um, so I, I've been there and, you know, the campus pretty well. Um, you have the Harvard Corporation, which we are finding out more about. You have Penny Prister, who apparently is sort of the base of that board. Elevated the first black female president of Harvard. Make Penny look good. It's white guilt. Because why would you why would you lift the money up to have for eleven people? I mean, you know, I've seen this too much in academia. And look, I have friends in academia who are black who work the bust off. But they don't play the race game. They're not Claudine Gay. They're never going to get that attention. They're far more accomplished than her. They're working at State University. So when you do that, when you play that game, when you tank, where Penny Prister, you know, wants you to look good and wants you. Uh, do this. And not only that, now she has to deal with the fact that she's Jewish. She has to deal with the fact that this horrible incident happened on October 7th. And then she has a president, a black president, that could not properly muster up the humanity because she um, it's a racial ideologue. I mean, that's my only explanation for why you, all, all those three women were the same thing. Those other two women were doing the same thing too. Because the point was, they were captured to the racial ide um, ide um, ideology, DEI, all that diversity. I mean, the whole thing for diversity, I mean, we could call it DEI, but for the last 50, 70 years, it's been a sham. The reason why I was a brief digression is I'm black and I'm Jewish. So I knew it was a fraud when I turned 17 years old because they said, we love it. You're beautiful. You're black and Jewish. You're the future of America. But here, you're one race, pick it. And don't pick the Jewish race, because it's not, I mean, you can talk about being a race or not, but we obviously know what you should be picky, which is black. And so that sort of, so that's why I knew it was, why, why would you do that? Why would you pick me as a black person? Why would you want to question me to do that? And, um, oh, because of the oppression of black people. Well, my grandfather, who was born to slave, lift your family up to the middle class, a lower middle class. My parents lift us up into the middle class. And that's, I mean, that's my, I don't know how you, that's, that's my uh, lineage, that's my responsibility to continue that forward and to kind of betray that by picking the very, by doing the very thing racially identifying myself, the very thing that they hurt my father, he was seen as black and his segregation, my grandfather. Those who pick up that label again, it's why I use it for an advantage. It's seen wrong to me. And here's one other thing I was born profoundly deaf. I cannot hear if you stick a gun and shoot it off. I mean, I've got this um, cochlear plan. shoot it off. I cannot hear a thing. The college has never cared one thing about that. Never. So a real, a real challenge, a real disability, they care. Black. That's what they cared about. And so if you think about that, just my small example, multiply that across America. You start seeing this energy, this, this, this focus on race, after the civil rights movement and the great betrayal and why. Well, because white guilt is black power. So Penny Prister, she gets that virtue of lifting up the black president. Claudine Gay, by playing the rape card, gets her black power because she's exploiting white guilt. 
to get you the power of tradition. So that's why we have this um, forest in America right now, where we're staying there going, my God, is Merrick dead? What's the point of working hard? She didn't work hard. The president of Harvard is a plagiarist. The president of Harvard is incompetent. What message are you sending to my son, who is just about to, he's 15 and a half. He's looking at college shit. He got like a 4.5 GPA. He wants to look at Harvard, you know, because of the name. So what kind of message are you sending to him? And so obviously, you know, I have to say, you know what? You have to, you can never, I mean, people say merit is dead. Uh, I disagree. I think merit is always there. I think there's always corruption. There's always has been. We're human beings. We will, people will cheat. People will do things to, you know, get by. But it doesn't mean that we have to abandon the idea of merit. And I think the best thing to do if you want to have an honorable life is to try to live your life by merit as much as possible. I certainly did pay the price for not checking the black box. But you know what? I didn't pay the price. Uh, actually, I, would, I take that back. Because I think I would have never checked that box because I may not be as successful as I thought I would be or anything. But I can say that when I earned today, I did do my talent. Right. And that's why I can sit here and be critical of other people. Because I'm not compromised. If I had checked that race bar, like Clarence Thomas did. And so every time Clarence Thomas opens his, opens his mouth, now I'm not, I'm not faulting him. That was a very different time. I think that was in the 70s. That was at the beginning. I had much more knowledge probably than Clarence Thomas did. But every time he opens his mouth, they go, oh, but you benefited from affirmative action. We gave that to you. So therefore you owe up. Keep your mouth shut and get in line. Well, that's pretty. So, what do you want? I mean, so do we want function as human beings or do we want followers? I mean, what do we want? Yeah. <clears throat> no, I, I think you have a, a lot of it absolutely correct. Um, I, I Just as, as two kind of exemplars in a sense, uh, there's Barack Obama and Kamala Harris. Um, I think Claudine Gay, the president of Harvard, exemplifies what I call the Kamala Harris effect, that Kamala Harris was chosen to be in a box. Yeah. Biden had made a promise with James Clyburn of South Carolina. They gave him, he, he was floundering or uh, on, in the race. He was going nowhere and he needed South Carolina and they just flipped South Carolina for him. They put the black boat out, but there was a promise. And the, I'm pretty sure the promise was to get a black vice president because Biden is old and he might die in office. And then we would have, you know, James Clyburn oriented candidate. So in advance, they decided they needed a black and they needed a woman. Yeah. And so you've already cut down the choices for vice president to like 6% of, of the field. So you're only looking now getting back to sports a basketball team doesn't look at only 6% of colleges or 6% of the country to field a player. They're not only going to look for at New Hampshire, you know, when they want to draft, they're going to look at the whole country. And so this was an, an extremely limited pool and, and Harvard did the same thing with Claudine Gay. I think they wanted somebody who was harmless, who was anodyne, who would, you know, just kind of like rubber stamp, whatever they wanted to be. And she had, the 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 right lens, you know, if because <laughs> because we see color, and and it's just kind of an odd thing. So we wound up with Kamala Harris, whose major qualification is her Jamaican father, not even her Indian mother, you know, and 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 this 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 plays out in you know in, in, in should she become the president tomorrow? I mean, we we will suffer. I think Harvard has suffered from the playing out of this drama where, you know, we don't look, I, I, I would be happy to have Thomas Sowell, you know, as president of Harvard and president of the United States. I would be happy to have, you know, Larry Elder, you know, be governor of my state. You know, I, I, I race is not an issue, 
you know, Obama himself is half white and half black. He grew up with a white family. Um, but when, when push came to shove, he knew his political avenue was to be black. And so he went to Chicago and became kind of blacker than he actually was. He, he, he was dating a series of women who were not black and, and in his memoir said, I have to basically dump them. I need to get a black wife politically. Yeah. So Michelle, Michelle Robinson, Michelle Obama is unfortunately an affirmative action hire, you know, yeah. as his wife, you know, so, so it comes down to this thing where we sacrifice. I mean, I, I assume they're happy and they, they, you know, have children and so forth. God bless them. But, you know, people for all this talk of white privilege, people are, are, you know, getting a success pathway through facial characteristics. And, and, and I, I understand there's some heritage there. Um, did you find in your own um, pathway, um, did you find this a, a positive or an impediment? And I, I would like you maybe to speak to the scholarship episode uh, you mentioned in, in that interview. Uh, you were offered a scholarship. Um, I, I, can you speak to that race-based? Yeah, it was um, a $25,000 um, Martin Luther King scholarship. And, um, but the problem when you do something like that, when you ship something based on race is that, that was my issue was right? that I, at that time in my life, um, I had kind of gone through the black power phase um, in high school, I did. I, you know, really Malcolm X, I, after my father's door, let him hey, she'd go through the phase. I was, you know, um, and so I kind of realized, oh, it's a dead end. Okay, the, the black bees, the black power thing. Wait, you know, the knowledge and everything. But I quickly came to the conclusion that I had a far richer identity as an American than just being lucky everything through the black land. And so that was sort of my mindset when I applied to college. And um, I refused to check the black box. And so then I'm refusing to check the black box the right where I accept that scholarship. And that scholarship obviously was contingent upon me checking that black box. Because if I remember correctly, if I checked that black box, my application would have gone over to that side of the, of the university, obviously the black side. And I would have been evaluated with that. And, um, and so, but then you're not in the mainstream, you're not um, part of that. And I'll, I'll backtrack a little bit, but you know, I, I come from a multiracial family. So when I was growing up, there were a lot, there were members of the family that did not accept my um, parents' interracial marriage. And the same thing happened to my father with his parents' own interracial marriage in 1944. So my parents got married in 1967. And so I was wow almost this year. And so I um, witnessed how certain family members held on to the racial identity at the expense of the family. And every one of them eventually has realized that holding on to the racial identity was not worth the family. Every one of them came back. And so that taught me a bit less in riches, that humanity is far greater than race, that you always pay a price for race and rarely, and you're rewarded with humanity. I mean, we, we have humanity, you have a family, you should be around. I mean, and, and when those family members came back, we had great times, we had, we did not hold on to the past. We moved on and uh, we accepted them and we had great time together. To, and, you know, sadly, we would have had more great time and so when you bring in two different cultures, two different races, you have to go through that process of bringing people together. I've gave you people to understand that there's more to life than race. And so that's been a huge, I mean, a huge lesson for me. And um, and I would never betray that lesson. And so that's sort of why I never checked the party. Because it was sort of a regression the other way. And... Um, and at the same time, I don't think there's anything special about me or anything. It's just that um, I'm just growing up with the values. Um, the, my Jewish ancestors and my black ancestors, 
came, they believed in America. Even my black grandfather, what to follow up every single day. He was a better American than the rice deprivation. Because he did not practice race. He did everything in his power within his deprivation role, deprivated role. And pushed that limit and eventually the chip of rice fishery, which he played a role in. Um, even as a foot soldier, a foot soldier and a community leader, he played a role in that. And there's tremendous pride to be had in that. And it was all about America. Hey, you guys, you know, you rights deprivationists are betraying the American principle. All men are created equal. I'm here to judge you. Let's get this on this, let's get everybody on that same page. And then you, I'm supposed to go back the other way. And so that's why. Somebody like Kamala Harris, when you or, or you know or Obama or Claudine Gay, when you rely on your race, you are going back the other way, and that's why the country is in uproar over there. That's why the country is disappointed. It doesn't know what she do, and but it's not hard. The the, the way to do is stop rewarding people on the basis of race. Start treating them like human beings. If they say I'm black or I have been stuck with this and so forth, well, okay, but what are your accomplishments? How is that going to help you with this job? What skill do you have to make this, to do this job and make the company or the country better? And I think we're getting very tired of race now. I think we're starting to see there's a very disruptive force. I mean, just look at Chicago, look at Brandon Johnson. He wants to remove some of the top high schools to Chicago because it's not fair to the black students on the bottom. The other schools, so the black students at the, at the top schools to Chicago have to pay the price because the city of Chicago won't reform the poor school. Now, parents are responsible. I mean, they, they and no shame on the parents for not stepping up. My own grandmother led a, a boycott of the segregated school for one year in Chicago in, 19, in the 1950s. So if my grandmother can do that in the 1950s, we should do that today, but we're not. And some of these very poor schools have like 4% proficiency in math, 6% proficiency in English. Those kids are doomed. But no, we're not going to shut down the poor school and put the kids into the best school. We're going to shut down the best school and and and, and to cater to the lower common denominator. That's what race is always about. Race is about victimization, about you know being on the bottom. And to mm-hmm. flip, we flip it to merit. So if we make merit a guiding principle instead of race, then everybody benefits. But when you make race your guiding principle, everything you become worse. Yeah, you know it's 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 ironic. I had an interview with Rabbi David Waltby last week, and he's wonderful. And he mentioned that a generation ago or two, um, you would not be able to marry outside your race, um, and po- politics didn't matter. Today, people won't marry outside their politics, hmm. but race doesn't matter. And so this this points to the fact that, you know, despite all the talk, 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 talk about race, 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 it doesn't really matter on a personal basis. There's far more intermarriage. And, and the family is really the political unit uh, that matters to us most. We, we get our most uh, solace. We get our most pleasure from being around our, our family and our mates and our friends. And that has broken the racial barrier. But on the other hand, we are insular and protective about people who disagree with us politically. And, um, you know, so that's an interesting irony. But I I actually want to maybe segue slightly to something from your movie. Uh, If I'm quoting it correctly, uh, your dad had, you know, invited um, kids in St. Louis uh, from the projects, from the poorer parts, uh, to come to his home, your home. Um, How did that play out? And, and, And so... You know, presumably it wasn't a racial issue, but it's a class issue. Um, the, you know, the, the crime and so forth. Um, we, we seem to have, have conjured race as, a, as a, a marker for class. 
And I'm wondering, you know, can you speak to this invitation uh, of kids from the inner city to come to your home? Actually, I think it was to the Upper Bound program. He was Tishi in East St. Louis. So he had invited the kids from um, Pru Igo, it's across the river. And so he invited them to come to, I guess, you know, get um, a helping hand up or, you know, uh, a, a guy, a, um, a pathway up. The problem was um, there's a book called, uh, I'm, I'm trying to see if I have the book around here. I think it's called Beyond, Beyond the Ghetto Walls or something like that. It was written by Lee Rainwater in the 70s. And I encourage everybody to read that book because that book will tell you. There's a great about 40 page section in the beginning of the book about this one man who enters the project, married, and you know, just needs, hey, I need a stable living. I'm gonna be an American, I'm gonna go out and get a job. And you see how the project she gradually wear him down to the point that by the end of that 40 page story, he's a conspiracy theory. He's a nationalist. He's radicalized. He sees everything through race. He's moved away from America into a racial identity. It is one of the most damning things I've ever seen. He was interviewed by the student from uh, Washington University in St. Louis. So when you read it, it's basically his just word uh, verbatim. And it's just rebelli. But it will show you the mindset that so my father was trying to, uh, to help these students, uh, these poor black kids. My father at that time was only like maybe 23. He was young, I mean, he was just out of college. None of them came, none of them came. None of them took the opportunity. They were too far gone. They didn't have any hope. They had bad faith. Everything around them was stone naked. Who and I go were cut off from, I mean, it's right near downtown St. Louis. But for them, for some reason, it felt like that they could not make that leap. They could not get a better life. So um, the violence went up, the drugs went up, everything went up. It is one of the most damn books I've ever read. And it's horrifying. And um, that's still a problem that we have not dealt with in America. You can't help people that are lost. You can't help people that don't want to be helped. Well, they have given up. And that's sort of what we're saying about the post dishes liberal uh, ideology was that it took away the Asian sheep from black. White came in there and said, we'll help you. We'll make your life easier. We'll take you from this slum, which a lot of the black actually own. They own the property. And we'll move you into this house departure. Well, but guess what? You don't own anything. And then the projects went right into the ground. Women could not leave. They would go shopping for a whole week. One time, because she'd go outside. The home was violence, rape, everything. The way they designed the buildings was horrible. So my point is, these projects were just so... Uh, I mean, I, I, you know, now can we just sit there and point the finger at these poor black people who were born in the project? No, that's not fair to you because they 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 didn't shine where they wanted to be born. But we as Americans are responsible for creating the condition. We're responsible for telling black people we will fish you. You can't do that. You can help people, but you can't take charge of somebody else's life. My grandfather survived the Holocaust. Right after about 1947, they were in the Lower East Side, in the tenement of, um, you know, the Lower East Side. A family, all the survivors were crying about how their life would be better if so and so had survived. And after a while, my, my father, my grandfather, my Jewish grandfather's days, you know, kind of blows up and says, why are you all crying? There's nothing we can do about the past. There's nothing we can do except go to work. I mean, there's no justice. There's nothing. I mean, they killed our whole family. They killed his sister. They killed everybody. What justice can you get? And so but, but by that, you know, everybody in that room went to work and everybody in that room died uh, middle class or better. 
And so that's sort of the lesson where, um, because I think a big part of the fraud tradition, all of that is white guilt. White people were so ashamed of their um, of the racism that they wanted to take charge of black people and redeem themselves. Huge right. mistake. <clears throat> now, so the so the white guilt um, and the Great Society. So the 1960s Great Society, I think, caused the opposite. I think there had been a, a black accretion in wealth. In the 50s, uh, that was the largest, the 1950s, that was the largest to that point. And there was higher church attendance in the black community than in the white. And there was uh, cohesion in the family. The, the, the basic political unit had cohesion. The, the Great Society, LBJ's um, Great Society, welfareized the black community. Um, and basically incentivized the disappearance of the black father. People got money. The welfare system was ostensibly to get the rare case of a single mother adequate care and finances to care for that child. So it came uh, maybe with good intentions, but humans are able to game any system. And once the incentive was there, people started to pretend the father wasn't there in order to get the money. And after a while, they didn't have to pretend because it just became its own system. It became uh, an inculcated system where the men would be like fish in the sea. They would spread their seed and disappear. And the kids would grow up in this milieu you mentioned. Now, uh, this, this, I think, has brought a, a horrible... Um, uh, tension and a horrible uh, kind of capture of certain fragments and segments of the black community, as it were, as an underclass. Um, it has given in, in this a perverse incentive to you know stay poor to get benefits, and it's broken up the family. and And, and boys, in particular, without a father figure, seem to stray more than girls do, and. Um, you know, what we see, I mean, is there a way to pick up the pieces from this? And I'm just wondering if you can speak to the white guilt, great society push. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, why, why, my question would be, well, why does the, in the city of Chicago, you have a black mayor, you have a black, uh, I mean, I don't know if the police chief now is black, but you've had black police chief, black, have a teacher union, black, everything. A lot of the cities do, but how come they never fix their poor school? How come they never go into the, the community and say, you know what? I became the mayor of Chicago. You should do anything you want. That really, that message, that message was there in the 80s. I mean, both Jackson was on the commercial thing. Just do it. No excuses. Just do it. Both Jackson is a perfect example of how you live your life. I mean, he just works. I mean, right now, what's he doing? Not only me, like he's got a me company now. I mean, he's just worse. Well, that's the kind of black people that my father grew up around. His next door neighbor became, I think one of them became a Broadway star, or at least uh, uh, had a career on Broadway. Another guy became, uh, I think, head of a regional FBI office. I mean, he's talking about men, people who are in the 70s. He's talking about a long time ago. And so there was this drive, this, this, we can be the kind of people, everybody that I know that has to escape, um, you know, the projects or welfare, has to escape largely by usually the American principle. They have not escaped by usually principles of dependency. They said, I want something better for my life. I know people that have gone to 12 schools in 12 years, I know people that have been very tempted by the welfare. They see it in their family. They see it in, their, in that. And they go, you know what? That's not for me. And they go the other way. And so um, we actually society, we have, the, we have, my father always states that we don't have confidence in ourselves as Americans. We've lost confidence in ourselves. You can sort of steer the way we're handling the whole Israel-Hamas thing. 
with the, with the United States president in the Middle East. Well, if you go to touch with anybody in the Middle East, the only they respect his power. They don't respect this merely no, they respect power. Show me where the power is. You know, I'll organize my stuff around that power. I'll decide if I want to fight you or not. And so we don't have we, we have the principles, but we don't have confidence in them. We don't have leaders to believe in them. And so when you don't have that, when you have Joe Biden going up there and saying you ain't black, if you focus Trump. I'm going to hire the first black Supreme, female Supreme Court justice. What are you telling the world? What are you telling my children is, is your race matters the most. And then now my kids have everything in them. The mother is from um, first generation born in America, her family from Mexico. So my kids, I think these even more mixed up. And what you're telling them is, Race is a part of my life. I have to game this system. And um, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, but that's sort of what, that's the, I mean, that's sort of the, the big corruption that we're putting in this country. And so if you want to turn it around, it's easy to turn it around. But people in the country, I think, have become so weak that they can't resist the evil of race. They could benefit from that for them, though. They take the criticism. Claudine Gay knows that she is being lambasted, but she's holding on for something. Money, power, to be a duel, or she simply just has a different moral compass to the rest of us. Well, that, that's a good point. So I think the moral compass is the thing that counts. Um, I, I'm, I'm just curious, do, do your kids, um, if they were offered a scholarship, um, do they check a certain box? Would they get a scholarship based on it? I'll give you one quick story. Um, I have a friend, um, well, uh, it's a mixed marriage, black father, white mother, and, and they wound up, um, they wound up very wealthy. Uh, and when push came to shove for them to go to college, uh, they don't need any scholarships. They, they're multi-millionaires and, and I asked, I said, you know, is your child going to check, you know, the box, whatever. And, um, you know, because there was certain scholarships for black kids. And she's like, yes, of course. <laughs> um, you know, it, 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 I don't know. Um, it just, it's just it's a tricky day because um, maybe you know, some people, some people don't, maybe they don't know about um if you find to be fair, maybe they don't know about uh, how the rape game works. Maybe they don't know. I mean, I do know. I, I know. Look, I know. I know. Look, I know. I've met people that shut the bar. You know, they, maybe they're still a middle class. They have enough money. They shut the bar. Because they get that scholarship money. They, they, they. In other words, they know what's going on. They have ownership over it. They, they be stupid enough to give me that money or do it because you know I'll take that money. I'll be in a corruption. I'll give my career. I'm not gonna let it bother me. I know people like that. The power of them is they want to do it that way, but the problem with that is the principle. Do you have people that are millionaires? Well, you're taking money, you're not helping society. You're not helping black people. Your child is a mixed race child. I mean, I hate the word mixed race, but your child is, you know, wherever, wherever he wants to be. If President Obama had came out and said, you know what, I am and been and fully embracing identity in terms of ways that you know what, I am what I should shine. I am. I am not what society tells me I am. Obama said that. He said, Well, they see me a black, so therefore I'm black. Well, if you if you give power to that, then you have no power with your identity. You become beholden to that blackness. So those kids, maybe one in my own family, we have every color. So and from the same mother and the same father, different colors. So what are you supposed to do? The lighter one gets left, and the darker one. I mean, that's just dumb. And they all grew up in the same way. They all grew up in the same household. So I think the problem is you should give power to race rather than embrace your humanity. Because if Obama he came out, is you know what? I come from an American story. My mother is from the Middle East, my Midwest. 
my father's from Kenya. They met, they married, and I'm an American. I represent all of American. Yeah. That would have been such a plan for me. It would, it would, it would push us onto that track. Yeah, I agree. He had an opportunity. Play the great yeah, game. He, he, he threw his uh, his white grandmother under the bus. Uh, one of those debates, if you remember. Um, it, it's you know, if, if she was black, he would have not done that. No. And, and this this concept that, that only whites can be racist. Um, I, I was uh, reading a post by Lara Logan uh, yesterday. And uh, I remember an episode, I went to Yale and I was at the Yale club in 2011. Um, and uh, there was a, there's a TV reporter uh, named Janet Wu. And uh, she was the, the guest, you know, she's special. She was, you know, quasi famous. And this is at the time. This was uh, the uh, Mo the Muslim Brotherhood. The, there was there were riots in Tahir Square to get rid of Mubarak in Egypt. And Lara Logan, intrepid reporter, she was in the middle of Tahir Square in Cairo, and she is a you know woman um, and not Egyptian, um, not Muslim. And the Muslim guys marauded her and absconded with her and raped her. And um, this was a you know a known incident at the time, and Janet Wu was asked a question about that, being a reporter, and what what the situation you should put yourself in as a reporter. And she she had this moment where she's thinking to herself out loud, but there's a microphone, you know, so we heard it. She's like, well, that can't really be a hate crime because Lara Logan is white. And well, that's that dehumanization. Yeah, and, and mind you, this is before the Me Too movement and Believe All Women. Um, but it's like, he, my mind exploded at that. I mean, I, I managed to keep it, you know, put, put the pieces back together for today. But, you know, it, it, was, it was, I don't know if, it, I don't like the term hate crime. But it was certainly a crime and, and they didn't respect her. And, you know, rape is kind of on the hate side of, 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 uh, of things, you know. Um, yeah, and and to to kind of dehumanize her because what her if she had been you know a Latino mother if she had been from Cuba it would have they, then they would have been well, bad. maybe not Cuba but, <laughs> but Cuba the I mean the thing of more oh, I know because yeah, yeah. they verge they verge Republican therefore they're white this all gets becomes yeah, yeah. crazy stuff where people are putting people into tiny little buckets in their head before they can think. But, but that was her filter, and she's a reporter, and reporters ostensibly are there to report. The, the item there to report was that there was a rape, you know, or if you want to investigate it, you could, you know, go further. But from all apparent circumstances, it was a horrible assault and so forth. And, 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 and she's already trying to minimize it. And this is pre, you know, Hamas war, where people are trying to minimize it based on the cast of characters and their color. I think people should turn the lights off and, and, you know, just kind of like, you know, go dark and do, do a podcast version of everything. Um, yeah. it's, it's, uh, I, I think it was actually, um, was it Alan West? I don't know if you heard about this thing. Alan, I think it was Alan West was on, a, I might be getting this wrong. Um, uh, maybe, you know, there was a, a, a black, uh, conservative on the radio and somebody called in and says, you have you know, if, if only you were black, you would understand the black experience. But because it was the radio, it's like you can't see me through the radio. Yeah. Uh, do you remember that incident? Do you know, no, 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 no. I'm deaf, though. I don't, I don't listen to the radio. <laughs> uh, that's a good point. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, I, I was insensitive just then. No, but I, I think I think what they did with the, with the Lara Logan, they was if you about that, I would say that if you bring up the Me Too movement, all of that. I would say that when you have uh, the uh, the DEI, we use that's just the latest term, the oppressor, the oppressed model, is the greatest enemy of justice. Is the greatest enemy of human of humanity. Because when you reduce people to the immutable characteristic and assign value on that, you're doing these that thing, the, the, the white supremacist, these you slay to black people under segregation, you're engaging in the worst human behavior. 
And those segregationists, those slave owners did that for one thing, wealth and power. So the people that are behind these forces today are doing it for these staff things that woman was um they was all oh, she was white. What she's doing that because she calculated, she's making a calculation in her head. Power, money versus humanity. And she's trying to rationalize it by saying because Lara Logan is white and therefore part of that racial history she does not count. Well, think about the leap of logic that you have to make. Think yeah. about the and, and, and annihilation of the individual that you have to make. The dehumanization of the, uh, that you have to make. Now, you should argue about the merits of the Me Too movement. I know plenty of women, um, too, much, too many women that have been sexually harassed in the workplace. Well, those people that embrace that ideology are the enemies of those women. And many of those women are now waking up and realizing that the leaders of that movement were against them all along. They used their victim, they used their true victimization for power. Hollywood is not better today. It's not. It's still going on. Um, and so I mean, I mean, the, if you still hear about a corporate workplaces, so what was that whole movement about? You had a couple of people that benefited. And so that's why we have to keep stop giving these people the power. We need to cast these people. We need to, what's your name? Um, Star Store, Star Store. Yeah, we need uh, Linda, remember Linda Star Store? You need to call her out for what she is. She is the divider, she's the exploiter. She doesn't care about Palestinian people. When she, when she celebrates Hamas, well, you have to understand if you give any credibility to Hamas, then you are validating Hamas's plan to have thousands of Palestinians killed. That, that's what they happen. You, go, you can't go over to any other country and do that and not expect any form of retaliation. So you have signed off on the death of thousands of Palestinians. So other Palestinians who are being killed, are they happy with Linda Star's door? Do they see her as their savior? I mean, that's a good question to ask them. And so that's a problem in our society. It's just so corrupt. They we think that these people are our savior. They're not. Look around. I should go on, but that's my um. Well, that, we're, we're, at, we're almost at, at the end of the hour. Um, what I'd like to give you is an opportunity for final words. I'm going to pull up some of your um, pages so people can find you online. Um, so, so any any final words for our audience? Do you have any final words for us? Oh, oh I thought you gave me, okay. um, No, I think that, I mean, I think that, um, hmm, that's a tough question, right? I, mean, I think a lot of it is that um, I just keep coming back to it's just something that I can't you know, let go of. I mean, I, I've seen a lot of negativity in our country, but when I'm looking around people, um, you know, every day, my neighbors, my community, um, we're good people. Uh, a lot of us truly care about America, and um, both of my grandfathers, to the dying days, always said this was the greatest country that ever lived. I mean, ever is dead, and I believe in that. And so that's why I um, never let go, and I think that the country is worth fighting for, and I think the answer to the, to the problem of, uh, of uh, the basically lie in the American principle. And we need a discipline to embrace and live by the principle. And if we do, we will truly have the greater country because if we lose the country, where else do we go? Right. You have to invent another America and you know that should be a very hard battle. So I think it's worth fighting for it right now. Rather than to brush it, we don't have any new land in this world to go to unless you want to go to the North Pole and start a new country or go take over somebody else's land. I mean, you know, so, so we are, for better or worse, we're stuck in this, uh, on this uh, land, and I think it's worth fighting for. And the more the more we stand up and, less, and, and give less powers to raise, less powers to immutable characteristics, we make it. I'm always optimistic. 
Well, thank you so much for that. Um, I, while you were speaking, I put up some of your pages, people can find you on Substack and on Twitter and, um, and uh, the Michael Brown movie. I, I recommend people follow your work and uh, I'm very honored to have been on the show with you today. Uh, I, I end with a quick self-promotional. I just want to, uh, people want to help support my podcast. <clears throat> uh, they can go buy my book. Uh, it's even better if they read it. Uh, I'm just going to show it to people here. Um, I've got a few other books on the way, but the book I have out now is is about the last pandemic. Um, it's about the Zika microcephaly pandemic. You may not remember it. It was Brazil, babies with small heads, um, mosquito illness, uh, Zika, <clears throat> and then it just disappeared. Um, and so that's, a, in my view, a fascinating story that uh, has gone against the narrative. Uh, I have not been able to get any of the mainline infectious disease people to comment on my theory um, that Zika is a real virus and microcephaly is a real problem. It just so happens that one doesn't uh, cause the other. They're not connected. And so uh, this is a faulty science. There were no Zika tests in Brazil at, at that time at all. There was no Zika tests on Earth. Uh, there was no um, comparison. There was no registry of microcephalic um, births. And it was all done on the fly in a matter of panic and pandemic uh, mixed together. And it had a lot of foreshadowing of what we saw during COVID. Totally another topic uh, for another day. But I think it's an enlightening um, book because I personally <laughs> learned so much writing it. Uh, I would like people to get that benefit um, <clears throat> from my hard work, hopefully. Um, and I, I'm very much in your debt for uh, having gone. I actually, uh, I got to tell you, I do have a, a movie treatment uh, for the story I'd love to show to you um, uh, that uh, Daniel Jupp wrote for me. Um, and it's a fictionalization of the kind of the, the story behind this, how this kind of got whipped up uh, into a tornado of, <clears throat> of intrigue uh, that, that affected, you know, throughout the tropics and potentially the whole world. And there's going to be a Zika vaccine in a year. So the story is going to come up again uh, later on. Um, so people should be aware of this. And um, anyway, I'm in there uh, in, in your debt for uh, having come on the show. I'm, I'm, I hope people will follow you and learn from you. Thank you so much, Eli. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. And I appreciate all, all right. your question. Thank you. All right. Have a good day.